All right, I think we can get started. So we'll continue talking about clustering today. And I think on uh, Wednesday, assuming we get through enough today, Ryan will start doing non-parametric function estimation, regression. So on last week, we talked about one way to do clustering using the density, which was to identify the modes of the density and then to divide the sample space into the basins of attractions of the mode. And we saw there was a very simple algorithm for doing that called the mean shift algorithm. And we saw there was some nice theoretical properties of that method. But that's not the only way to extract clusters from the density. There's another method which is very related, which is called level set clustering. And the idea of level set clustering is very similar to uh, hierarchical clustering, which we'll get to in a in a few minutes, and most of you have seen hierarchical clustering where you, you form a dendrogram of the data. If you haven't seen it, don't worry, we'll talk about it in a minute. This is very similar. Level set clustering, the idea is this. Just as the name implies, you cut across at a level. So there's a level. Let me use the same notation that I did here. Say this is t. And so this, this set of points where the density is bigger than t, so L of t. That's called the upper level set. Sometimes I say level set. Statisticians, in fact, often just call this the level set. It's actually the upper level set. And you can see we can decompose that into some connected components. So the idea is to write those into connected components. Uh, say over L. Those are the clusters at level t. And as we vary this thing, we'll see that we get different clusters. Right? You can see at some point it's going to change. These two clusters will merge down here, for example. A new cluster might be born at some point. And it's not hard to see, and this is a good homework exercise, to say that the, these clusters form a tree. What do I mean by that? So if I call all the clusters at a given level CT, and if I put them all together now, the union over all t. So this is all the clusters I get over all different levels. If I were to pull out any two sets in here, you can see that either A is contained in B, or B is contained in A, or they're disjoint. So they have a kind of tree-like structure. Things split and merge or contained in things. So this cluster, for example, is contained in this, sorry, this cluster is contained in this cluster, and so on. These two are disjoint, and so on. So it, has a, it actually does have a tree structure to it. And so that means we can represent it. In fact, there's a, a couple of pictures on page 10 which show you these trees. You can see clusters splitting. I guess, um, did I draw these upside down? Maybe not. No, no, actually, this is correct. So this is just showing you the, exactly the structure. Now, this has some advantages and disadvantages over mode clustering. So first of all, the advantage is it gives you a, more information. In the mode clustering, you just get a clustering. That's it. Whereas here, you're getting a kind of a more multi-scale type of thing as you're looking at different scales and seeing how the clusters change. That might be a good thing or a bad thing. If you want to get more information, you get more information from this. On the other hand, if you want some definite clustering, level set clustering doesn't give it to you. It just gives you a tree. Of course, you can always decide if you want to cut it somewhere. Uh, also, this is the nice thing about this is it doesn't matter what dimension the original data are in. The tree is something you can always visualize. So it's a nice way to kind of visualize a density function. So if nothing else, it's also a good visualization tool. These examples are meant to show you just a simple two- and three-dimensional example. How do you actually compute this thing, though? Because if you think about it, we're going to estimate the density in the obvious way. So the level set L hat will just be wherever P hat is bigger than T. But suppose I actually estimate the density. I find the points 
in this upper level set, but how do I find out what the connected components are? That's non-trivial. How do I know? I mean, I, of course, in one dimension, just looking at it, you can see. But if I have a high dimensional density, I find a bunch of points where the density is bigger than some number t. How do I know which ones are in the same connected component? So the way that's typically done is to form a graph. So the algorithm here is on page 9. We first compute p hat. Then we find the set of all points, so I called it x sub t, or the set of data points where the estimated density is bigger than t. But we still don't know how to organize those points into their connected components. So what we basically do is something which is very similar to hierarchical clustering, in fact. It's sometimes called geometric graph clustering. As we form a graph, we form a graph g sub t where, and, and I'm forming it on these points only, and we connect two, two vertices, the vertices corresponding to the points, if and only if, let's say x, i, and x, j are less than some critical distance apart. And it turns out you can take the critical distance to be the same as the bandwidth you used for the density estimator. OK, so we, get a, we have a density estimator. I'm going to assume a kernel density estimator with bandwidth h. We find all the points whose height's bigger than t. Now we form this graph, so the graph might look like this. Maybe we connected these points together, and maybe we connected these points together. And here's some more points. Once you have the graph, the connected components can be estimated by taking the connected components of this graph. Given a graph where you have adjacencies like this, so either two points are adjacent or not, there's algorithms, there's various algorithms. You can use breadth-first search or depth-first search to find the connected components of the graph. In fact, in, uh, I, in R, the package is called iGraph. I don't, I'm sure the same thing, there's probably a similar thing in MATLAB. But in iGraph, you just give the adjacency matrix to iGraph, and, and it'll very quickly find the connected components for you. That's your estimated clusters at that level. Now, you have some bookkeeping to do, because you have to do this at each level. And then you have to keep track of which things are nested in which things. But fortunately, this has been done for you. All right, so there's, uh, I know two very good software packages for doing this. They were both actually written by students at CMU. So Brian Kent was a student in statistics a few years ago. He loved Python. If you like Python, there's a link I put there to his Python package. It's called Debacle, which stands for density-based clustering. <coughs> and it produces all the plots for you. It estimates the density. It produces the tree and everything. It's quite convenient. Um, I can't use Python. So luckily, another student, Fabrizio Lecce, he wrote a software package actually which is about something else. It's, it's, it's something called topological data analysis, and the package is called TDA. It's an R package. But he included in there this density-based clustering. So it's a function in, his, in that R package. And again, you just give it the data and the bandwidth, and it produces these plots for you. That's how I got those plots, in fact, and so on. So this is pretty easy to do. There's lots of software to do it. And if nothing else, again, it's another way of doing clustering, but it's also a way of visualizing uh, a density function. So these are not quite the same thing, mode-based clustering and density-based clustering. You can see that they're related, because uh, every time I come down here and hit a new mode, I am giving birth to a new cluster on the tree. But the but mode clustering just gives you the clusters, whereas density-based clustering gives you kind of a nested set of clusters and a visualization of the clusters. Let's, um, let's just say a couple words about the properties of mode-based clustering. How will I say? or sorry, density-based clustering, or I should call it level set clustering, really. How well is it doing? I need some measure of distance. So again, what I like about level set clustering, like mode clustering, is that it's clear what we're trying to estimate. There's a population quantity we're trying to estimate. It's, just, it's these, it's these uh, level sets of the, of the density. One way we might measure how well we're doing is to look at the estimated level sets and the true level set and ask, 
how close are they in some distance? We could also do the same thing for the clusters, although that will follow from the distance of the level sets. So how do you measure the distance between two sets, though? And I'm going to use what this thing H, which is called the Hausdorff distance, which is the most commonly used distance. It's certainly not the only distance. But anytime you're comparing sets, the most common way to do it is Hausdorff distance. So it's a good thing to know about. And what is it? It's the smallest epsilon. Let me write it down, then I'll say it in words what it is, uh, such that So what is this? B plus A means take every point in B and grow a ball of size epsilon around it. So if this is B, and imagine at every point I put a size, a union of balls of size epsilon, it's going to grow that set by size epsilon. And what I'm asking is, if I have two sets, A and B, here's, I can ask, first of all, What's the smallest epsilon I have to grow A to cover B? And what's the smallest epsilon I have to grow this to cover this? And now I'm going to take the, the smallest epsilon such that both of those things happen. And that turns out to be a, a metric on the space of all compact sets. And it's a very commonly used metric. It's a very strong metric. Because if I just take one point and put it far away, it makes the distance very large. But that's called the Hausdorff distance. And theorem 4 on page 11 shows that under kind of standard conditions, we get that this is of order log n over nh to the d. Actually, um, I'm missing a term there. <coughs> this is actually. The, this is the level sets. I'm ignoring the bias term. That's the level set of our smooth density. And this is the level set of the estimator. And if you don't let h go to 0, which you, you don't have to let h go to 0 for doing clustering, then you can really just think of this as being almost a dimension independent rate. The proof is, you should look through the proof. It's only, you can see, it's eight lines long. But one thing you'll see in the proof is it doesn't apply to every level set. And there's a good reason for that, because look at this. Let's look at this level set right here. This is a very unstable level set. If I move this up or down, the level set could change quite a bit. Actually, that's not a good example. Let me show you a better example. <coughs> Let me add that in. This is a better example. If I move this up or down, I might be, have this interval, which is fine, but I, might, I may or may not include a par point very far away. There's no way you're ever going to estimate that level set in Hausdorff distance accurately, because there'll always be variation around there. But you can't hope to estimate that in Hausdorff distance accurately. So what the theorem says is, except for these difficult level sets, which turn out to be a set of measure zero in terms of the height here, you estimate all the other level sets accurately. All right, so, so there's another type of clustering. And I'm trying to keep the same spirit going in all of this discussion, which is let's not think of clustering just as algorithms. Let's think of them as estimation problems. We're estimating something, and we should be able to say something about how well we're estimating it. OK? Any questions then about the level set clustering method? Sorry, the level sets of the true density. Or at least of the smooth density. Now, I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about a new idea that's become very popular lately. And the reference here is Chazal, Guibus, Udo, and Scraba, 2013. And it's this notion that's called persistence. And it's just a way of summarizing, well, it's actually a very big area. But in terms of this type of clustering, it's just another way of visualizing the clusters. And it is part of this TDA package as well. <clears throat> but it's also a way of establishing, in some sense, which clusters are significant and which ones aren't. And the easiest way to explain this is with this picture here, all right? So 
So the notion of persistence is actually related to some very deep ideas in topology, but for purposes of level set clustering, it really comes down to the following kind of very intuitive idea, which is simply, if you look at this picture that I drew here, you can imagine, I start up here and I move down. Okay, and let's look at this. What happens here is that there's a birth of a new cluster here. And we go down and this cluster keeps growing. When I hit this point, there's a birth of another cluster. But what happens when I hit this point? These two clusters merge. So let's agree that the most recent cluster dies. It's called the elder rule. The older cluster will say, as a matter of convention, survives, and this one dies. So when you think about it, every cluster has a birth time and a death time. And in particular, small little bumps are going to have very short lifetimes. And the nice thing about thinking about it that way is we can now, if we plot the, the death and the birth time, what will happen is every cluster now is a point. And I've actually lined up each cluster here with, on that picture with the points. But if you think about it, what happens is a very small blip in the density. That means that the cluster will have a very short lifetime. Its death time and birth time will be very close together. What that means is that this point will be close to the diagonal. So this plot, which is called a persistence diagram, important clusters are clusters with strong persistence will be far from the diagonal, and small clusters will be close to the diagonal. So the nice thing about these diagrams, which again are included in the TDA package, is another way to visualize the clusters, but it shows you kind of the cluster strength. And I'm not going to go into the details here, they're a bit technical, but when you, if you try out that TDA package, it will also put a band here. And what that's doing is it's just using the bootstrap to say which things are significantly different from the diagonal when you do the bootstrap. Why do we want to do that? Because all these things in, that get lost in this band you can say are not significant clusters, whereas these are significant clusters. In other words, if I were to put a, if I had a really small blip here, and if I put a confidence band around this density, some small blips could get lost in the bootstrap confidence band. Whereas something like this, even with a confidence band around it, the birth and death time of that plot of that uh, cluster, or that is the, the difference between the birth and death time, is larger than the size of the confidence band. That's a significant cluster. So this notion of persistence is now being used to sort of get across an idea that there's some clusters are more important, some clusters are less important, and some of them you could even say are statistically significant. So that's a whole big area in itself, and I, I don't want to go into it in any great detail. I just wanted you to be aware that if you try that TDA package, you're going to get one of this plot might pop up. That's what it is, and it's actually a useful way to look at clustering. It has another advantage again, which is it doesn't matter what the dimension of the data is, this persistence diagram is always a two-dimensional plot. This is always a big problem, right, is how do you visualize things when you get beyond two dimensions? So anything like a tree or a persistence diagram that allows you to visualize things independently of the dimension is, is pretty useful. Okay, so that's just a small extension of level set clustering. Uh, so in this method, at any point of time, you do not cluster all the points, right? <coughs> that's right. So the disadvantage of this method is you, you never really have a definite clustering. You're only clustering all the points above a certain level. Whereas in mode clustering, we're looking at the full basins of attraction. Everything is just clustered at the end. Yeah, so one, you know, they each have their advantages and disadvantages. Any other questions? Well, so it's f a funny thing is that the way I defined it is time starts off here, which is high, and goes down. Uh, so the, it is true that the birth is at a later time than the death. So maybe I'm using the wrong terminology. In fact, the way the topologists do this is they flip the function upside down. So, that, so you can actually talk about birth and death in the normal way. But statisticians like to think about doing clustering this way. 
<coughs> so, and so you'll see actually, and if you see the, the paper I refer to, they actually have birth here and death here, and they reverse things which kind of make sense. So yeah, just because of the way I've, I've labeled things, it is strange that birth occurs before death. But if I just define this to be zero and then increasing instead of the other way around, it would just fix the problem. But it's just a matter of nomenclature. Yeah, that's a good observation. Okay, any other questions? first one. So it's the elder rule. When two clusters merge, the one that was born first lives and the other one dies. And there's, there's reasons for doing that. See, that I should say that this is part of something uh, more complicated, I, I said it earlier, topological data analysis where you have to keep track of a, a lot of bookkeeping of more complicated objects. And that elder rule is kind of important in all of that stuff. But you can just think of it here as a convention. It means that way that the Bigger clusters are the ones that have the longer persistence. Anything else? All right, so mode clustering and, and level set clustering are probably less familiar to you. Let's now go to the one you probably all know and love, which is k-means clustering. It has the advantage of being familiar and very simple. It has the disadvantage that it doesn't work very well, <coughs> <laughs> except in special circumstances. <coughs> so let's review how this works. And I'm going to try to stick to the same format. I'm going to first define the population version. So let's say, what is it you're estimating when you're doing uh, k-means clustering? So let's think of we have x1 to xn is a sample, again, from some distribution p. And what do we try to do? Well, we try in k-means clustering to pick a set of centroids, as they're usually called. Let's say k of them. For now, let's say k is just given to us. Let's not worry about the problem of picking k, although that's a tough problem. And how do we pick the centroids? Well, in the population version, what we do is we try to uh, minimize the following quantity. Did I ever write it out? Well, let's look at, for, for any x, let me draw it in one dimension. So I have some distribution. Let's suppose I decide I'm going to use k equals to 2. I have to decide where to place these two centroids. I imagine drawing a random x and comparing it to each centroid. And then I take the minimum. So if x lands here, I'm looking at this distance. If x were drawn here, I look at this distance. distance. <coughs> and now we're looking at the expected value of this. And that's called the risk of that set of centers. And what we're trying to do is choose c star to minimize, to minimize this. It's worth drawing what the risk function looks like as a function of x. We're always comparing ourselves to the closest x. So this is the distance, uh, closest c. This is the distance here. It goes up. But now this is closer. This goes down. So for any configuration of c's, we actually get a function like this. Only I didn't draw it well because it's actually quadratic. I kind of linearized it a bit. That's just poor drawing. But looks like that. And we're trying to can arrange the c's to minimize that distance. So it's just set, trying to say when I draw a new x, I want to make it as close to a centroid as possible. That's the population version. The, the, um, and I see that in my notes. I don't think I ever wrote the, oh, it comes later. I just did it in the opposite order. So now there's the empirical version of this risk. I don't know the true p. I don't know this expected value. Nevertheless, I can do the obvious thing which is you give me some data, and I'll estimate that expected value with the average. And so the empirical risk of a set of clusters, or a set of centroids, I should call it, is just 1 over n times the sum. And now we just take xi minus cj squared minimizer 
That's the empirical version of the risk. And now the goal is to choose c hat to minimize this. All right, so that's the official k-means problem and solution. These centroids define a clustering by what's called a Voronoi tessellation. So if I have C1, C2, C3, what we're doing, remember, is assigning each x to its nearest centroid. So that means that that forms some sort of polygonal region here. Let's see if I can draw it. Didn't draw it that well, but everything in here is closest to C3. Everything in here is closest to C2, and everything in here is closest to C1. Okay, That's the Voronoi tessellation defined by the centroids. Now the problem, or actually there's several problems, which is how are we actually going to minimize this in practice? And what kind of clustering does it lead to? And what are its properties? I drew a more complicated Voronoi tessellation in figure 11. You can see they get pretty complicated. Well, the most common algorithms, and you should have learned this in 701, is sometimes called Lloyd's algorithm, which is just an iterative algorithm. It's very simple. We pick some starting values, and this turns out to be important. So we, we take C1, C2, CK. They might be randomly chosen from the data points, but there's better ways to choose them. But we're going to take some starting values. Now we simply do an assignment of each x to its closest centroid. So assign, assign xi to the closest c. So that's, that's the empirical version of finding this Voronoi tessellation. Each data point now, I can find its distance to the centroids, and I assign it to the closest one. That creates clusters. Now I just take the average. I replace each CJ with the average of the XI in cluster J. That is, I've, I took all the points that were assigned to that centroid. Now I just take the average. That's going to change the centroid. Now I reassign. I just repeat until convergence. That's Lloyd's algorithm. That's probably the way you learned how to do this in 701. And it's how most, like the k-means function in R does it this way. I'm sure the, the uh, function in MATLAB that does this probably does it this way and so on. It's very simple. So you can see this is very appealing because it's really easy. It feels a lot like the EM algorithm. OK, so far, so good. We have kind of a criteria we're trying to do. We have some sort of algorithm. Now let's get to the problems. There's a, a bunch of problems, um, which is the first one, and the, probably the most important one, is uh, what problem are we really solving here? Why does this lead to good clusterings, or does it even lead to good clusterings? And the, the general wisdom here is if there really were k well-separated clusters, hopefully not too far, far from spherical, then you will get some sort of reasonable answer. But outside of that, you can get some strange things. So I'll show you some examples. Look at the top of page 13. This is called the Mickey Mouse example. And... Um, If we, if I have three perfectly balanced clusters, this example, by the way, is uh, on Wikipedia. This is the first place I saw this example. If I r run this with k equals to 3, no problem. You're going to get cluster here, cluster here, cluster here. You're in good shape. Actually, not completely. There's even problems there, but 
if you, if you do it a few times with random starting values, you'll be OK. The problem is, what if they're unbalanced? Then it turns out you're going to get a clustering like this. All of this is going to be one cluster. All of this is going to be cluster 2. And all of this is going to be cluster 3. And in fact, that's correct. That's, if, if you actually analytically figured out the optimal solution to the population problem, this is, this is what it looks like. So the algorithm is actually finding the correct solution. The problem isn't with the algorithm. The problem is that k-means is just, the definition of k-means is if I drew a random guy, I want to make sure it has low expected distance from the nearest centroid, this is the solution to that problem. Somehow, the definition of k-means by using centroids isn't capturing what we mean by a cluster here. Notice that density clustering would have no trouble finding these three clusters. So this is an example where any sort of density clustering method would work really well. K-means does something a little bit fishy. But in fact, it's easy to create examples like this. Let me just make a more extreme example. A, a very common test case people use is to put data on a ring. Again, density clustering will have no trouble with that. In fact, we did this example last time. But if you do k-means, what are you going to do? If I do k equals to 3, what's it, it's probably just going to say, well, this is one cluster, <coughs> this is one cluster, this is one cluster. Calling these three clusters somehow seems kind of odd. You could say, well, if I just took k equals to 1, that would fix the problem in some sense. On the other hand, if there was other stuff going on here besides this, that might not be a good idea. The point is that, again, if the clusters are kind of approximately spherical or very well separated and balanced, there's no problem. But if you get either funny shaped clusters or imbalanced, highly imbalanced clusters that are not well separated, it's just not going to behave in a way that you might consider intuitive. The other problem with k-means clustering is not just the shapes, but that minimization we're doing is actually NP-hard. So there's all kinds of minima. And it really is going to matter which starting values you pick. The good news is that problem has been largely sol solved. But let me just give you an inkling for what that problem feels like. Here's an easy example that I think I got this from Misha Belkin. <coughs> it's a very simple example that just shows you that random starting values is, is not a very good idea. Just make nine spherical normals. So this is page 18, figure 17. It's a little bit hard to see the figure, but I just have nine normals. And I'm going to tell you k equals to 9. So the hard problem of choosing k is gone. Now try running k means clustering. And if you, again, the typical thing is to pick random starting values. But you can see you're not going to get a good solution unless you happen to get a starting value in each of these guys. But now you can ask the following questions. What's the probability, if I choose nine points at random, that I get exactly one in each of the nine clusters? And you can do a little combinatorial calculation, and it's like zero. <laughs> I mean, to you know, 0. 0.000 is something very, very, very small. It's just not going to happen. And so. Random starting values, it's very easy to break that. Fortunately, there's a solution to the starting value problem. And I actually put a few possibilities, but I'll tell you the, the best one, which is on page 18, which is called k means plus plus. How many of you have heard of k means plus plus? Oh, yeah, so it's kind of catching on. Maybe that's about a quarter of the people. It's very simple, and I think a lot of people did this before without giving it a name. What was different with uh, Arthur and Vasilvitsky, if I said that right, is that they have a theorem that shows that this actually works well. And it's really simple. And it's a good example of something, even though it's an NP-hard problem, you can find a probabilistic solution which comes arbitrarily close to solving the problem. So NP-hard doesn't mean it's unsolvable, right? It's, you can often, with high probability, come close to solving the problem. And this is a good example of that. So what you do is, let me just draw a picture of some data. It's th the algorithm is written out, but I'm just going to just show it to you on the board. 
you pick a point at random. So your first starting value is just a random selection, let's say this. Now what you do is you compute the distance of every point to this point squared. So now you have a bunch of positive numbers, and you normalize those numbers to be probabilities. And now you draw a point proportional with those probabilities. So this is going to have a low probability of being picked. This is going to have a high probability of being picked. So let's say you pick this one. Now you have to recompute the distances, but not to the first point, but to the closest one. So you compute this distance, this distance, this distance, this distance, this distance, this distance, square it, normalize them to be probabilities, and again, draw another point with that probability. Okay, and you do that till you have k points, and those are your k means plus plus starting values. Then you run k means. Yes? It's uh, without replacement? Drawing without replacement? No, you can do it with replacement. Yeah. Now the question is, how well does this do? If I now use those as starting values and run k means to get the solution, and what they showed in a very simple uh, inductive proof is the following interesting fact. If I look at the, we're just talking here not about the true risk, I'm just talking about trying to get the actual minimizer of the empirical risk. So if I look at the empirical risk of this solution and I take the expected value, this is over the algorithm because this algorithm is random. So I mean the expected value over the algorithm. How close does that come to the actual minimizer of the empirical risk, which is again is NP hard to find? And the answer is it's less than 8 log k plus 2 times the true minimizer. So this is pretty good. <coughs> this is kind of a constant. There's a k there, but it's logarithmic in k. And uh, in practice, I can tell you, I've, for example, I've, I like, I, you can try this nine normals example. I've never had it fail. I'm sure there's some probability that it fails, but I've never had it fail. But if you don't like this, const this big constant here, there have since been improvements and extensions of the algorithm that make that even smaller. You can make that pretty much as small as you want, in fact. Basically, it's a matter of doing a few extra steps. You choose a few more than k starting values, and then you prune it back, and you can make that um, I forget what the best is so far. I think, I think, anyway, I think you can even make this into a constant that doesn't even depend on k. So there's now a lot of tweaks on k means plus plus that make it the accuracy even better. And in fact, there are streaming versions of it, so you can do it in a streaming fashion and so on. There's a lot of, this started a whole research area. So for me, that's the uh, go-to method. I always use k means plus plus to start off the what happens if I choose the farthest point? So that's called, um, there's a name for it which I'm forgetting, which is to do a deterministic version. Is pick this point, then pick the farthest one, then pick the farthest one. I think that's called the k-centers uh, algorithm, is that right? The problem is that as far as I know, there isn't any guarantee like this. And it can sometimes lead you astray if there happens to be an outlier and so on, but presumably this could also have that same problem. But as far as I know, Oh, that does have a guarantee. Actually, that does have a guarantee, too. But I, I believe that this has stronger guarantees than that algorithm. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting what, I'm not sure if it's called the case center method, but there's a name for that, what you suggested. And a lot of people do use that in practice. To the best of my knowledge, k means plus plus, though, seems to be the best method. Yeah. Well, this is, we are still using k-means. It's just a way of picking good starting values. And so the intuition is that if I pick a point here the first time, I now have a low probability of picking a second starting point in the same thing. So it's kind of like the deterministic one. It's going to be much more likely to pick something here and much more likely then to pick something here. It's going to prevent you from doing this because that's going to be a low probability selection. The reason why the improvements give better things is you can see that if I pick a few extra points, I increase the probability that I'll get a good set of uh, starting values. And so that's why the improved versions pick a little bit more than k as the initial starting, and then they remove some points. <coughs>
Any other questions? Uh, just as a, a ban on the expected risk? Yes. Uh, Yes, they all, some of these other papers also have high probability. So with probability 1 minus epsilon, if you do this this many times, you can be sure that you get within this epsilon of the optimal risk, that kind of thing. Yeah, so in fact, so at the time I wrote this, the, I think I cited uh, yeah, Jaswal and Monteleone as having, I think theirs is called K-means sharp, had, a similar, had that kind of guarantee. But there have since been further improvements, so this is pro probably not up to date. And I think, actually, I think also, um, I'm blanking on his name, he used to be here. Uh, Ravi Kanan has another version that has high probability bounds. Well, that's a good question because that gets to the whole problem of should we even be doing k-means. Um, my quick answer to that is I think a better thing to do, although I've never proved this, is to do k-means with k really big to overfit it and then merge clusters together rather than trying to choose an optimal k. But maybe a better answer is to even not even be doing k-means. So, <coughs> yeah. Although k-means has advantages. It's fast and easy. Right. This is the, and this the importance of that, especially in high dimensional problems, cannot be understated. Any other questions? So, if a larger number of centers are picked, how are they typically merged? Well, okay. So I, that's why I was reluctant to say that is because I I have a kind of heuristic for how I do it, but it's I've never proved anything about it or written about it. Um, so. That, that, piece, that piece of advice was meant to be very vague. <coughs> Choosing a large number of clusters and merging them. You know, I, my, I'm just saying that if the clusters look like this, if you think of fitting you know, six spherical clusters and then merging these three, that might help you find better shaped clusters. But I don't actually have any official theorems about that. It was just a kind of piece of wisdom. But it may, it may be wrong. Yeah, I almost didn't say that because I was afraid somebody would ask me for details. <laughs> All right, so the real big problem, though, that we haven't talked about is how do you pick K? The short answer is no one knows. And the proof of that is there are papers every year still appearing in journals and conferences about how to pick K. <laughs> Everybody and their uncle has a method for picking K. And None of them are totally satisfactory. And I've listed a whole bunch of them. And I don't, the, it's there for you to read for your interest. I, I just want to uh, mention what some of them are. So one of them is to use a kind of informal hypothesis testing. and. I mentioned this one called SIGCLUST because, and sorry for the MATLAB users, but this is a, a package in R. <coughs> and I like to talk about things where there already exists software to do it. And it's, but the idea is very simple. And in fact, people have used this before, but this even works in high dimensions. This is due to Steve Marin at UNC and his colleagues. And the idea is pretty simple, which is they actually do, what they do is they start by taking the mean. And their view is this. K-means clustering is trying to find, roughly speaking, normal shaped clusters, you might say. It's not going to do well with rings and things like that. So let's take as a kind of a null hypothesis that the clusters should at least be roughly normal. So what they do is they start with one mean, and then they do a hypothesis. Oh, then they, yeah, then they fit the normal. They have some tricks for the high dimensional case, because estimating a normal, even in high dimensions, is hard. But so they just fit a kind of restricted normal. You have to restrict the covariance structure. Then they just do a hypothesis test. Does this fit or not? A goodness of fit test. And the way they do it is they now do k means clustering with k equals to 2. So you now get maybe something like this. And we look at the sums of squares within each cluster. So if you just look at the distance of all the points to the cluster center, that's the training error. That's what we called the risk. And here it would be the sum of this and the sum of this error. That's what the training error is in, in the 
and k-means, and they just look at the difference of the risk from 1 minus 2, and they ask, is that significantly different? And the way they assess that is they say, well, under the null hypothesis, this is sort of like the truth here. So they actually do a simulation. They simulate from this normal and recompute. They generate data from that distribution, recompute the statistic, and they get a null distribution for the statistic. And then they just take the observed value, just like we did in 705, and compute the tail area, <coughs> get a p-value. And then they keep going until it's not significant. And this, I, w I don't want to say that this is completely their invention. People have been using ideas like this for many years, but this isn't a very good implementation as far as I know, and it, it as I say, it even seems to work well in, in high dimensions. But the idea is just simple. You start with one, then you go to two, and you go to three, and you do some sort of hypothesis test that you're really asking, does the data fit two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, and so on. But it is making an assumption that if you've got a good clustering, that within the clusters, the data should look somewhat basically normal-like because they keep fitting normal distributions. On the other hand, that's kind of what you're buying into in some sense when you're doing k-means clustering, so maybe that's not so bad. Um, so I said in the notes, that's currently my favorite approach, and I, I made a point of saying currently because if you ask me two months from now, there might be something else I like better. Um, there's been lots of other ideas. That I have a whole section here on what's called stability, which uh, I put in for your interest. I'm not going to go through it, but I was excited about this at first. There was quite a bit of uh, research for a while about a good clustering should be a stable clustering. One way to assess that, for example, would be to split the data into two, cluster both halves of the data, and see if the clusterings are similar. That would be one way to assess stability. And there was quite a few papers about this. And then there was a, what I would consider a pretty deadly set of papers by, uh, let me find the reference. Uh, ben David, Von Luxburg, and Paul, 2006. This is on page 23 here in this large paragraph. And there's, some, there's been other people uh, since then I've also referenced, which basically show you that it doesn't work. You can find lots of bad clusterings that are very stable, and you can find lots of good clusterings that are very unstable. And since it doesn't work, I really don't want to spend time discussing it, but if you're interested, just go through this section because I've reproduced the key examples. This picture on page 24 is from the Ben David paper, and it's pretty convincing that these stability ideas, at least as they've been presented so far, really don't capture what we mean by good clustering. So if I have any advice right now, I think I would use the hypothesis testing approach, but don't hold me to that. I'm sure you can find examples where it's not going to work too well. This is just one of the hard things about k-means clustering, which is just choosing k really is, I think, a, sort of an ill-posed problem in some sense, and it's very difficult. And some people would say you shouldn't just use any specific method. You should try different values of k and try to make some sort of judgment about what's working well for your problem. Maybe we shouldn't be relying on automatic techniques and so on. But that is kind of a, a difficult thing. In density clustering, there's a tuning parameter to pick there as well, which is the bandwidth. Although I think that's, in my view, it's an easier problem than picking uh, k in k-means clustering. But maybe that's just a, a bias I have. All right, so we have the basic method. And if we settle on some way of picking k, then we do have a complete method. So you pick your favorite method for picking k, whatever it is. Then you can run k-means plus plus to get the starting values. Then you run k-means. It is a fairly complete method in that sense. And now we can ask what the known properties are. And uh, they're pretty interesting. Actually, there's been a lot of theory about k-means clustering. And some of it relates to concentration of measure. In fact, most of it relates to concentration of measure. So what I'm going to do for you is state the theorems. But we'll come back to the proofs 
if we have time when we talk on about concentration of measure. This is a really good example of where VC theory and concentration of measure and rata makar complexity and things like that turn out to be really useful because it was using those tools that people were able to prove these things. But let me just tell you what the results are. And the results are not so much on the centroids. It's not saying that you're finding the right centroids, which is very difficult because the centroids is a is an unstable problem. You can often find configurations of the centroids that are very different but have almost the same risk. Remember that the risk of a, of a vector of centroids is the expected value of x minus cj squared minimum. What we're going to establish, <coughs> or what we're going to state at least, are statements about the risk. That doesn't imply that the centroids are close. Okay? If I have two different clusterings whose risks are close, it doesn't imply that the centroids are close. It's a very unstable problem in that sense. That's actually the problem with those stability methods. So first, I'm going to state this result. Which I forgot to put what year it was proved. But oh, here it is. It's 1994. This, was, this version of the theorem is due to Linder, Lugashi, and, and Zieger, 1994. And here's what happens. So remember that, remember that there's the true risk. Then we had our empirical risk. I'll call it this. Okay. There's some C star, which minimizes this. We don't know what that is. And there's a C hat, which minimizes this. This is what you get. You get to minimize the empirical risk, C hat. And I'm not going to say that these are close, but I want to evaluate the true risk function of the, of the clusters that we found. And this is assuming, by the way, that we can find the minima. So here we're, we're throwing away all computational problems, assuming we can minimize the function. We're just talking about the statistical properties here. And the theorem says the following thing, that if I look at the risk, the true risk of the empirical minimizer, so this is actually random because this has a C hat in it. And I compare that to the risk of this thing. So this is the risk I would get if I could actually get a hold of the true probability distribution and find the best centroids. How much am I losing by the fact that I'm doing this from data, not from the true distribution? The answer is the error is of order Now, we're going to see a different result in a minute, which has some improvements on this. Let's take a look at this. So k over n, it kind of makes sense that the more centroids you're trying to estimate, the worse the bound's going to get. It's a bit disappointing that d comes in here like this. But we're going to see in a minute we can get rid of that. And the log, well, that's nothing. You don't worry about logs. So, so this proof that, uh, as I said, we're going to skip for now. If you know VC theory, you might want to look at it. It's on page 25. It's not very long, but, I, but since we haven't done VC theory in concentration yet, I want to skip it. But just take a look at the result, and let's see what it's saying. And there are sharper results. that I want to talk about. Let's jump ahead to page 26. This is a more recent result in 2008 by uh, Bao, DeVroy, and Lugashi using a slightly different technique. They obtain a different bound. So it's this, I'm going to say it's the same thing here. But let's look at this bound. It's actually a little bit more precise. It's a const, let's ignore constants again. So it's a constant times k over root n. For those of you who are familiar with concentration of measure, this is a VC-based proof, and this is a Radomachar-based proof. This is the difference between using VC dimension or Radomachar complexity. For those of you who don't know what that means, you'll know in a few months. Okay. Let's compare this. Which one's better? It depends, right? Because this is k, and this is root k. So in terms of k, this is a better bound. But the remarkable thing is this is dimension independent. In fact, the proof takes the way they do the proof is they do it in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. 
So the dimensions actually, they even allow the dimension to be infinite. So the, the benefit of this result is you get rid of the D. The downside is you get a stronger dependence on K. So it obviously depends which situation. If you're in a high dimensional case, this is the more interesting result. If you're in a lower dimensional case but have high K, then this is the more interesting result. And again, the proof's pretty short and easy, but it does use techniques that we haven't got to yet. So the nice thing about this is uh, it does give us some really good information about the fact that k-means clustering in some sense seems to be doing well. But remember, saying that this is doing well is not saying that the clustering is good for two different reasons. One is we can't guarantee that the, the c hat is close to the c star, just that the risks are close. But there's a more fundamental reason why we have to be cautious about this result is because we saw even the, the true population clustering might not be a satisfying clustering. All this is saying is you're doing this almost as well when n is large as if you had the true probability measure. But we might not like the solution we had even if we had the true probability measure. So that's a separate issue, is whether the best clustering is even a good clustering. OK. Any questions? Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. <coughs> All right, good. So that's k-means clustering. And now. These notes are kind of long, so you notice I'm not covering everything in here. Um, I'd like to uh, move ahead to actually page 29 and talk about another common method, which is hierarchical clustering. There are many, many different flavors of hierarchical clustering. Probably, I would say, the most common are agglomerative methods, which mean bottom up. So let me just say how that works. And I'm sure most of you have seen these before. I think at 701 you covered these. But the idea is, here's the data, and I'm just going to represent them now as points down here. We have some rule for greedily joining the points together into a cluster. So for example, we might take the two closest points and call them a cluster, which we represent here. There. Now we just continue. We continue grouping things together, but we need to do that. We're going to need not only a notion of distance between points, but a notion of distance between clusters. Like what's the dis distance between this point and this cluster? Or more generally, after we've done several steps, we can have lots of clusters. What's the definition of distance between clusters. And of course, there's many different definitions. I think the three most common ones I put here are uh, on page 30, single linkage clustering, which is just the distance between, say, this and this would be the minimum distance, <coughs> the closest one here and the closest one here. Or you could take the average distance of two clusters and the maximum, which is called complete linkage. And there's other definitions besides those, but I think those are the most three common ones. Taking the closest two points, the average of the distances, the farthest points. So single, a single linkage, average linkage, complete linkage um, for, for the R people, which hopefully is an increasing function. And just be careful when you use H class, which does hierarchical clustering, you have to specify which version you want. I think the default is, I forget the default, but it surprised me what it was. I don't remember what it was. but. I'm going to guess, let's see if Ryan agrees, that single linkage is the most commonly used one. Would you say that? Uh, I mean, amongst statisticians. Yeah. yeah among biostatisticians, probably 10 to 17. OK. So depending on the field. How many of you use single linkage clustering? Have used single linkage clustering? Really? I was glad everybody put their hand up. All right. <laughs> so what's the good and the bad here? So this is actually an interesting thing, hierarchical clustering, because first of all, again, we get out a nice structure at the end, which is a, a tree, which in this case is called a dendogram. I'm not drawing it very well. Do I actually have a <coughs> dendogram? I should have drawn a dendogram, and I forgot. But you can see I'm going to get a tree-like structure showing me when things merge. At the top, everything's going to be merged. So that's a good thing. You get to see 
just like in the level set clustering, you get to see this tree-like structure, which is very nice. Sometimes you might decide, OK, there's an obvious place to cut it. And you, you can easily cut it there and produce some number of clusters. This is very fast and easy to do, uh, well, relatively fast and easy to do. It doesn't take anything complicated, just computing distances between things. And it's very easy to understand. So it has a lot of advantages. And the distance can be anything. Any measure of similarity between these objects, whatever they are, they could be proteins, they could be documents, you can do this. So that's good. Um, the downside, there's always a downside, is that it's not always clear what it's doing. What is it estimating? What is the population quantity you're estimating here? And that's much less clear than any other methods. Now, there's an interesting history here, which is I think for many years people thought you were effectively trying to find high density regions. Because after all, if I have points like this and points like this, actually, let's do this one. The ring example works great with single linkage clustering. You'll just end up with a cluster like this and a cluster like this. It's beautiful. And so it really looks like what the clusters is trying to identify are kind of high density regions. Because if you're in a high density region, it's pretty clear they're going to get joined up pretty quickly. And there was even some belief that maybe this is estimating the high density clusters. In other words, when we talked about level set clustering, we were explicitly trying to estimate the high density regions. And there was some belief that maybe that was what was going on here. John Hardigan, who's a very famous statistician and has worked on many interesting things, including uh, a lot of stuff about clustering. He has a great paper in 1981. I highly recommend reading it. You can find it easily and download it, where he proved uh, a negative result. He showed that. Basically, he showed that hierarchical single linkage clustering is inconsistent as an estimator of the high density regions. So that kind of dashed the hopes that that's what that was doing. And in fact, people have revisited this. And uh, there's a very nice paper by Sanjoy Dasgupta. And I, there's some co-authors on that paper, which I forgot to put in. It's Dasgupta, 2010. But there's a few other people, which is very interesting. He says. Let's try to fix this problem. Let's try to modify hierarchical clustering so that it's still easy to do, but that the tree you get out is consistent in the sense that uh, high density region, any high density region should somehow appear as a cluster somewhere in this tree. And if there's two high density regions that are actually separated, they should appear separated on this dendrogram. And it's a very nice paper. But it turns out, if you look carefully at it, it's really just doing level set clustering. But it's doing it actually in a very clever way that makes it very computationally simple. It, it uses a slightly different notion than the, um, than the kernel density estimator that we used. But effectively, he's basically gone back to using level set clustering with a very fast algorithm. And th that's kind of the way to fix up hierarchical clustering. So really, hierarchical clustering fixed up is what we talked about at the beginning of the class, is level set clustering. So there's kind of interesting history there that sort of brings us back to level set clustering. So those two papers, Hardigan 81 and Dasgupta 2010, if you're interested, are make for very, very good reading. Okay, I know I'm covering a lot of stuff fast. I, I covered the first two types of clustering in a lot of detail because they were probably less familiar. And these ones I'm covering in less detail because I think you've probably come across most of these uh, before, or at least many of you have. So let's keep going. Um, there's a newer method called spectral clustering. Let me just see how many more methods I have in here. The problem with clustering, you know, is you could easily have an entire course on clustering. So it sort of goes on and on and on. All right, we're almost done. I think spectral clustering was the last one I put in here. So spectral clustering is pretty interesting. It's one of the newest additions to the 
zoo of clustering methods. I think it's got a lot of promise, but it's also, I think, a bit less clear what its properties are and what's going on, although it's very active. There's been quite a few papers just in the last few years establishing properties of spectral clustering, especially in networks. It seems that there's a lot of work showing that spectral clustering seems to do something reasonable when you have network type of data. But general results in spectral clustering, there's a few of them, but there's not a lot of them, and I think it's always not clear what's going on. But here's the idea. Somehow, we have to get a graph to start with to do spectral clustering. So in some sense, that's a big part of the problem. So if you're, if you're someone who uses uh, network data for things, you pro presumably have some notion of a graph of how connected different things are in your network and so on. If we're just clustering points in space, we need to create a graph. So if we have n points, we'll have some sort of matrix W. This will be n by n. And we're going to form this graph, and we're going to say there's a node for each data point, and two points are connected if and only if the weight is positive. Sometimes we're going to have everything connected, and so all the interesting things will be taking place in the size of the weights. So here's, let me give you two examples of weight matrices. A very simple one, which is very related to single linkage clustering, is this one. So let's just stop and think about this for a minute. Suppose I take the data points, any two points that are epsilon close, I connect them, that forms a graph. Finding the connected components of that graph as epsilon varies turns out to be exactly equivalent to single, single linkage clustering. And this is actually also called a geometric graph. And there's an entire book by Matthew Penrose called Geometric, I think it's called Random Geometric Graphs or something like that. There's all kinds of beautiful probability theory about these objects. But from our point of view, this is just now creating some sort of graph. Or if we think more like in the world of density estimation where things are smoother and we like nice smooth kernels, you might create weights that look pretty familiar. Something like a Gaussian kernel would be a natural thing. So in this case, everything is connected. It's a fully connected graph. But things that are points that are close together are going to have a higher similarity than things that are far apart. Okay, so now we have the graph and we have the weight matrix. In some sense, it's really the weight matrix, which is the important thing, which is just measuring, again, how similar things are. Two points that are really close together will have a high weight. That's all. And now we do this thing, is we form what's called the graph Laplacian. If you have not seen this stuff before, this will seem a little bit mysterious, but when we get to the properties of the graph Laplacian, I think it'll make a lot more sense. So what